We could go home right now. But we're not. But that's the conclusion. Sometimes it's good to have the conclusion before we know, because God knows the last chapter. He knows the final story. No matter what we're going through and what we're facing, we know who holds tomorrow. We know that our future is, is concealed in him. Why don't you turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. How do we deal with real life issues like fear? Because fear will come against every one of us. And I'm so glad we don't have to pretend. That's why it's called the real deal. Because too many times Christians are fake. We want to put on a fake smile and feel everything's okay, but real life hits us. Real life decisions, real life hurts, real life burdens, but I'm so glad I have a real God that can teach me how to deal with real life issues. First John chapter 4, beginning at verse 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. Aren't you glad he's given us his Holy Spirit? And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have what? Confidence, and Pastor Richie didn't know what I was speaking. He used the word confidence from Psalms earlier. God wants you to walk in confidence today, not in fear. Can I have an amen? This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Perfect love drives out fear. I don't know what you're full of fear about today. I want you to see that you have a little box, and in that box of your life is the fears that, that come against you, the fears that hold on to you, the fears that cause you to, uh, to stay awake at night, the fears that when you're not busy, uh, those fears come to the forefront of your thoughts and your emotions and your mind. And maybe your fears is your family. Maybe it's your future. Uh, maybe it's your, uh, your finances. Maybe it's sickness or, or your children. Maybe it's uh, 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 the future of death and what's going to happen. And, and, and the reality is, is that some of us or all of us will be fearful of something from one time or another. In fact, USA Today did a, an article on fears in Americans and they reported that 5 million Americans have a serious fear or phobia of something in their life. And in this article, they had a long list of phobias that people are battling with in America. And maybe you have uh, some of these. Uh, uh, maybe you would want to admit it. Maybe you wouldn't. But the reality is we're going to deal with all of these. Uh, uh, some of these are going to come into our lives and we're going to be fearful over them. Some people have claustrophobia. They are afraid of being in small, enclosed places. My wife's mo uh, mother, uh, we would drive in Boston through tunnels, and she would have a, almost a panic attack uh, because she couldn't feel being in a tunnel. And there are people that hate elevators, and they'll not go into elevators. Uh, there is necrophobia, the fear of death and of dying. There is acrophobia, the fear of heights. I mean, you won't go on a ladder. You don't like being on a roof. Uh, uh, you get in there, you get sweats. Uh, you begin to feel, you know, you get close. You know, you don't want to go up uh, uh, high buildings because of the fear of heights. There is agrophobia, the fear of being in public places. And there are some people who will never live, leave their homes or leave their rooms because they're so afraid of being in public places. Uh, there is astrophobia, uh, the fear of thunder and lightning. And 
there are some dogs that have that fear. There are, there are people when thunder and lightning happens that, that, it, that it overwhelms them. Uh, there is hydrophobia, people that are afraid of the water and they'll never go swimming. They, they have a hard time even going for a shower. Uh, there is the monophobia, the fear of being alone. There is pathophobia, the fear of diseases. There is toxophobia, the fear of being poisoned. Uh, uh, there is zoophobia, the fear of animals. There is cyberphobia, the fear of food. Uh, and now I know there's not a lot of people that have a fear of food. Uh, there's a lot of people who love food, uh, but there are some people who are so afraid of food that if they eat, they're going to gain weight and, uh, and, and they have a fear of that. Uh, there is even ecclesophobia, the fear of going to church. I mean, there are people that are afraid to go to church. They say that people hate going into a new church because they don't know what they're going to face. There is ergophobia, the fear of work. There's a lot of young people that have that fear. There's insectophobia, the fear of insects. And I'll give you two of mine. I have dentophobia. I, hate, I, I have a fear of dentists. And I have snakeophobia. These are real phobias. Uh, I have a real fear of snakes. Uh, I just don't like snakes. I hate snakes. In my, my last house, we lived by the woods, and, and there were snakes all the time. And when I'm mowing the lawn, there'll be a snake. Or if I leave the garage door open, the snakes would go in there, and I'd have to call my wife to come get the snake. It was a big snake. Uh, and she would come and she would pick up the snake and throw it out in the woods. And I could. God bless my tomboy wife. What causes you to fear? What is the thing that makes you panic on the inside? It doesn't take long to see that in the Word of God that fear was epidemic from Genesis to Revelation. And as we spent the last number of weeks in the book of Genesis and Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed God, all of a sudden uh, they were fearful of God. They were afraid of God because sin came into their lives. And, and there is a correlation between the fall of man and the fear of man. And when you read the Word of God, there are, in your outline, 1,500 references to fear in the Bible. There are 365 verses. Now, how many days are there in a year? Isn't it amazing that there's 365 days in a year and there's 365 verses that tell us not to fear, do not fear, do not be afraid. I, I think God understood that fear is something that every single one of us is going to battle on a daily basis and, and that his word gives us an answer. Do not fear, do not be afraid. In fact, in the last chapter of the Bible, it clearly tells us there will be no fear in heaven. Aren't you glad that when we go to heaven, heaven, there's no more fear, there's no more tears, there's no more problems, because God wants us to know that in his presence there is no fear. And we read in 1 John, perfect love casteth out all fear, and that I don't need to live by fear if I'm living by faith. I want you to turn me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10, and I want to give you four uh, keys to, to, to kill fear in your life, uh, a, a prescription to, to have victory over fear in your life. And Matthew chapter 10 and verse 26, and it tells us this, so do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. See, the reality is, as long as I try to hide what battles and situations I have in my life, I can't deal with them and God can't deal with them. But friends, let me tell you, God knows my fears. He knows my sins. He knows my mess. He knows my addictions. He knows everything about me. And guess what? He still loves me. He still loves me. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I'm not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's gate. Isn't that a great verse? That God cares about the birds. He cares about the things that we would put no reference to. You are not one of them. You will yet not 
not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. Verse 30, and even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, some of us, that's a bigger deal than for others. Uh, you know, and it takes a lot more concern for the Lord to count some of your hair. That doesn't, he just looks right over me and says, boy, all done. But the Lord knows the hairs that are on our head. It talks about the intimate level that God knows me. So in verse 31, so do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. See, God understands something, that fear is contrary to faith. And God wants us to be men and women, teenagers, young adults, children of faith. Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Because Jesus understood that fear is like a prison. It will restrict us. I, I remember every time I'd go out to mow the lawn, and, and I, I was afraid, man, is there going to be a snake? Is there going to be a snake? And, and so I, I would be very, uh, you know, timid, looking around. Where's the snakes coming from? There's probably not going to be a snake there today, but that fear just got a hold of my life. And there are people who have fear in their life, and, and it and restricts them. It, it is tormenting. Uh, it is a bondage that the enemy tries to bring into our life. He wants you to fear tomorrow. He wants you to fear the future. He wants you to fear going to the doctor. He wants you to fear because he knows that the moment I am bound by fear that I will never walk in the victory that God has given to us. And if you want to deal with fear, four things. Number one, you must reverence God. Look what it says in Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In the King James it says, And fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul. See, what God is saying is you need to reverence me. I, I mean, what are you worshiping today? If you're worshiping God and loving God and serving God, you don't need to fear anything else. I may walk down the street and someone pulls out a gun uh, or pulls out a knife and kills me, and they may kill this body. But friends, nobody can kill the soul. No one can take my soul from me. I can go to the doctor and the doctor says you have cancer. I can get in a car accident and my life can be taken from me. But friends, no one can take my soul from me. Friends, we need to worship. We need to reverence the one who can kill the soul. And the only one that can kill the soul is God Almighty. But I have a God who died on the cross for me, who loves me. And he wants us to reverence God. He wants us to fear God. Now that word fear God means to have a holy reverence and appreciation for God. It is saying that when I fear God, I'm putting God in his rightful place, that he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords, that God is on the throne of heaven and he's on the throne of my heart and I worship him because he, who, of who he is. Friends, when we fear God, we'll see how holy God is. When we fear God, we'll see God as he really is. The reality is, in America, we no longer reverence God. We no longer fear God. We've lost the reverence for life. We've lost the reverence for authority. We don't reverence, we don't respect, we don't have holy, a holy regard uh, for holy things anymore. Uh, we no longer have a reverent, reverence for God. We no longer reverence the Word of God. We no longer reverence the house of God. We no longer reverence the things that God has put within our lives. We just take it for granted. But God wants us, if we want to deal with fear, that I need to put God back on the throne of my life. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Keep your finger in Matthew 10. Isaiah was a mighty prophet of God. He was a man who walked with God, spoke for God, ministered for God, but a real life situation happened in Isaiah's day. It says in, in Isaiah 6, 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted the day King Uzziah died. Uzziah was a godly king. Uzziah was a king that brought peace and prosperity to the children of God. And now uh, Uzziah has died, and now there is uncertainty in the nation. There is uncertainty about what the future is going to hold. Uh, uh, friends, like a lot like we don't know what's going on in our world today. You look at what's going on, and, and we say, man, what's going on, and we don't understand it. It says in the year that King Uzziah died, in the year that 
that all, everything fell apart in their lives, I saw the Lord. You know what we need to see again? The Lord. Where do we need to see him? High and exalted. That I don't have a little God that's on the level of every other God. But as we sang, we have a great God. We have an awesome God. We have a Messiah. We have a God that is worthy of our praise. We need to see him high and lifted up. High and exalted, seated on a throne. That means that God is not up in heaven and says, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I don't know what is going to happen in the world. God is seated on the throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy. You know what we need to begin to say? God is holy again. God is holy. He's holy. He's a holy Lord. Holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory at the sound of their voices. It wasn't some little whisper. It says, at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook. I mean, because the glory of the Lord, the, 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 the temple was shaking. It, it was shaking. Let me, I'm going to speak about that in a minute. God was shaking in heaven. Why? Because when you see God high and lifted up and see him as holy, it says the whole doorpost and threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. And Isaiah saw what was going on in heaven, but he also saw himself. And what did he say? When he saw the holiness of God, he saw his condition in verse five, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphims flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched me. The reality is Isaiah had a healthy reverence of God. When he saw the Lord, he said, woe is me, I'm unclean, I'm not worthy. And when we have the fear of the Lord, we'll see the Lord as he really is, and we'll see our real condition. And when I see the Lord high and lifted up, and I reverence him and worship him in spirit and in truth, let me tell you, worship is more than just singing songs. Worship is my life given to the Lord. And when I see the Lord and I worship him in spirit and in truth, it's going to empty me of, of my religious pride. And, and, and it's going to re uh, release me of just going through the motions and, and singing half-hearted songs and, and just showing up to church. But I'm going to worship God and put him on his throne because he is high and exalted above everything. And Isaiah, when he saw the Lord, he crumbled down before himself and says, Woe is me, I am undone. He repented of his sin. The reality is when I worship God and reverence him, we take ourselves way too serious and we don't take God serious enough. We walk around life like the world rotates around Ron Squibb and, and that everything happens because of me and it's all about me. And we say, man, if I don't do it, it's not going to be done. And if I don't take care of it, it's not going to happen. And the reality is we take ourselves way too serious and we take God far uh, not serious enough. You say, God can't do anything. Friends, Ten, Ten Commandments tells us you shall have what? No other gods before me. And when I take, God, I take myself way too serious, God's going to begin to shake. He's going to begin to shake as the doorpost in, in Isaiah began to shake. And over in Hebrews chapter 12, let me tell you, God's going to do some shaking. You look at what's going on in our world today. God's beginning to shake some things. It says in Hebrews 12, verses 26 to 29, at that time, his voice shook the earth. You look at the, the, the increase of disasters in the world. You look at the earthquakes, the tornadoes. You look at natural things. It says at that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. 
Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. God wants us to know he's going to shake everything that can be shaken. He's going to shake this old world. He's going to shake this earth. He's shaking the kingdoms of this world. He's shaking the nations. Isn't it amazing? We thought we could solve the problems in Iraq. And we step out of Iraq, and all of a sudden the terrorists are back, and the, all things falling apart already. Why? Because God's going to shake the nations that don't put God on the throne. Friends, let me tell you, God's going to shake America because we put other gods in front of him. And we need to turn back to God and cry out for a revival. He's going to shake the nations. He's going to shake governments. Governments are up today and they're down tomorrow. And friends, God can shake America. He can shake the nations of the world. He's going to start shaking cities like never before because we put ourselves on the throne. And God is saying, I am high and exalted. I want to be God of New York City. He's going to start shaking churches. Churches that put anybody else on the throne but Jesus Christ. When we start thinking it's all about me. And it's my church. Let me tell you, God will shake the church. He's going to shake some homes. Some marriages and some families. Because when we put other things, he's going to start shaking, rattling and rolling. He's going to shake our careers. He's going to shake and loose those things in our lives that are not eternal. He's going to shake us until we fall on our faces before the Lord and cry out, holy, holy, holy. He wants us to get our eyes off of self and us and, and put our eyes back on the Lord. And when I put my eyes on self, that's when fear begins to come in. When I put fear, I focus on my physical body and what the doctor has said and, and maybe it's the sickness maybe it's the cancer and I focus so much on the sickness that I begin to get full of fear but God wants me to put my eyes on him then we don't deny the sickness we don't deny the problems but I stand on the word of God that by his stripes we are healed and even if I die I'm going to a much better place I'm going to be with the Lord forever I don't know about tomorrow but I know who holds my hand and if I die, he's going to walk with me to the pearly gates. He's going to lead me right there. Why? Because my God will never leave me and never forsake me. Oh, when I focus on my needs and, and my wants and my finances and I wonder why I'm struggling, God, help me to realize that, Lord, I need money and I need an apartment and I need a home and I need this and this, but Lord, you are my provider. You said that you will supply all my needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread, and I can stand on his word today. We used to sing another old song, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. And his grace. Oh, look over in Matthew chapter 14. Man, even the disciples battled fear. Friends, let me tell you, fear is something every one of us is going to have to deal with. In Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. Let me tell you, Jesus knows what he's doing before we know what he's doing. Many times we say, God, I'll only do it if you tell me what's going to happen. No, God says, you get into the boat, and you go on ahead of him to the other side. And while he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Sometime later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. How many know that the winds are going to come against you? You know, we always want the wind behind our back pushing us. But friends, you never know which way the wind is going to come from. And sometimes the wind's going to buffet us. Sometimes the wind's going to come against our lives and against our boat. And we don't know which way to go. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. 
And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were what? Terrified. Well, let's not get so tough on these poor guys. They're in the middle of a storm. They're in the middle of a boat. There's fishermen. They know what they're doing. This had to have been a great storm. And in the midst of the storm, the wind, the waves, everything's going on, they see something walking on the water to them. I don't know about you, I'm afraid of a little snake in the grass. If I'm in a storm and I'm in a boat and I see somebody walking on the water, I think I would react just like the disciples. Let's not be so spiritual. Ooh. They were terrified. They were afraid. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Aren't you glad he gives us assuring words? But now Peter has a disease that many of us have called foot in mouth disease. <laughs> you know, Jesus walks on the water. And all of a sudden, he's in this situation. And now, Peter didn't think. Sometimes we need to think before we pray. He says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, think before you pray. Peter said, if it's you, Lord, tell me to walk on the water. What's the first word Jesus says? Come. Come. How many of us have prayed prayers? Let me say, oh, Lord, I didn't mean it. <laughs> oh, Lord, if you give me that, I'll serve you completely. Oh, Lord, if you give me that promotion, I'll go on a mission trip. If, Lord, if you do this, I'll do that. And, and we say these prayers, and then God says, come. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, why didn't he see the wind? He was in a storm. He didn't see the wind because he was focused on one thing. He was focused on Jesus Christ. Friends, let me tell you, when we look at the wind, when we look at the problems, when we look at the circumstances, we get overwhelmed with fear. And when he began to saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. I love the next word. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. He said, you of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Friends, you want the wind to die down? Let Jesus get into your boat. You want the wind to die down? Let Jesus get into your marriage. Let Jesus walk into your family. Let Jesus walk into your finances. Let Jesus walk into your situation. Let Jesus walk in. When Jesus walked in, when he got into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Friends, this morning, put your eyes back on Jesus. Begin to reverence him. Begin to worship him. Begin to put him on the throne of your life. If you're overwhelmed by fear, begin to say, Lord, help my eyes to get off the marriage, off the kids, off the parents, off the situations, off the sickness. And Lord, let my eyes be put back on you and begin to worship him. Friends, worship needs to become a, a, a daily part of our life because worship is just inviting the presence of Jesus into your situation. If you want to deal with fear, reverence him. Number two, you need to confess him. You need to confess him. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Confession is something I do with my mouth. It is not something I just show up or I just wear. It says in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22 and 23, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. If you want to deal with fear, it starts with reverencing and worshiping. But then the next thing is I need to begin to confess Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Because too many times we're confessing the wrong thing. We're confessing the negative. We're confessing the thing that's coming against us. We're confessing the problem. Let's start confessing Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. 
See, you can accept Jesus privately, but you can't keep him private. You know, isn't it amazing in America today, everybody's coming out of the closet, and they're counted as heroes. They're superstars. This one comes out, wow. This one comes out doing this. This one comes out, and we applaud them. They get on Time Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential people of the year. Friends, it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to get out of just being in the church, and let's get public with our faith. Why are we ashamed? If we have the answer, let's start confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We may come to church. We may uh, uh, carry a Bible. We may uh, do the right thing. But are we confessing Jesus when we leave church? A couple of, we a couple of weeks, uh, we we saw the video, uh, weeks ago, we saw the video on Zimbabwe, Mutare. Uh, and, and I got an a email from the missionary that's over there. And uh, last Sunday, the second service, they had over 100 adults. And now they're having a water baptismal service in the next couple of weeks. They're bringing a tub up. Uh, they're going to baptize those new believers. And friends, when you get baptized in Africa, it is a big deal. You know, in America, we say, well, it's just a church ritual, and I don't really need to be baptized. I, I was baptized as a baby. Uh, you know, if you were baptized as a baby, that's great. We do dedications. Uh, but the reality is Jesus gives us uh, baptism. Uh, Jesus went down. He was baptized in water. He was saying, I, I, I'm, I'm confessing uh, Jesus Christ. He says, when you go under the water, it's signifying your death to the old life. When you come up, you're coming up in the resurrection power. It doesn't, the water doesn't do anything, but it is saying I'm coming out of the closet. It is saying that I am a child of God, that I am a Christian, that I am following him. And it's time we begin to declare who Jesus Christ is. It's time for the church to get out of the closet and to get out on the street. It is saying you must publicly confess me as your Lord and Savior because too many times we're more afraid of what people think of us and what are people going to say and what's my family going to say if they know I'm a Christian and what's my, my boss going to say and what's What's the friends going to say? The reality is, Jesus says, you are the light of the world, and the light cannot be hidden under a bushel. And we wonder why the church has no influence on our city. It's because we're hiding in a church building on a Sunday morning for an hour and a half, and we think we've done our duty, and God is pleased with us. God's not pleased with spectator Christianity. He is pleased when we go out and confess him as Lord and Savior of our lives. He he says light cannot be hidden, that light cannot be covered up, that light must shine in the darkest place. And we must say, Lord, help me to confess you with my mouth. There were four bakeries in a small town. And they were all located on the same street. And they were all trying to get the same dollars for the same donuts and the same bread and the same pastries. And sometimes they would go into competition with the other bakeries on their town. And one bakery put up a sign saying, best bakery in town. The next bakery put up a sign, we're the best bakery in the state. Down the road, the next bakery put up a sign saying, best bakery in the world. The fourth bakery said, we're just the best bakery on the street. Too many times, well, I got to be the best Christian in the world. Oh, I got to be another Joel Osteen. Oh, I got to be another Billy Graham. Friends, stop playing games. Just be the best Christian you can be. Just be what God wants you to be. Stop comparing yourself to somebody else. Well, I got to be like this one. Or I got to be. No, God doesn't want you to be anybody. He just wants you to come out of the closet and to live for Jesus now. Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me and my words, then I will be ashamed of you. If you want to defeat, uh, deal with fear, then you need to acknowledge him. You need to confess him. But number three, you got to love him. Look what it says in Matthew 10. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He's not saying not to love your father, not to love your mother. I love my father. I love my mother. Uh, you know, I'm the only kid that wasn't there. I wish I could have been there when the doctors came out and gave the news. But, uh, but I, my, my calling is here. And, and I have to love God more than sometimes my parents or, or my kids or my grandkids. And God 
God is saying, if you want to defeat fear, you love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Don't allow the love of anybody else to take the love of God. Because Jesus is saying, if I love him with everything that is in me, then love will be the motivating force of my life. But if fear is the motivating force of my life, I will hide from God. I will pretend with God. I will not be able to trust God when all hell breaks loose in my life. I'll not get close to people because I am fearful. But if love is the motivating force of your life, I can love God on the good days. I can love God on the bad days. I can love my wife. I can love my kids. I can love people. Why? Because 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Let me tell you, religion will make you fearful. Churches sometimes say, man, if you don't do this, you're a bad, bad, bad boy. I want you to know when you love Jesus and Jesus loves you, it will cast out all fear. We know the story of Peter that Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter again had foot and mouth disease and says, no, Lord, I'll never, I'll never deny you. I, I, I will never come against you. And we know that, Je uh, that Peter denied Jesus three times and the rooster crows and he goes out and Jesus dies on the cross. And in John 21, the resurrection has taken place and this is the first time that, that Jesus sees Peter. And it says in John 21, verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. But he just denied him. He said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was now hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. How many times did he deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus ask Peter, if you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. The first question Jesus asks is, do you love me? How would we answer that question if Jesus asked that of us? We'd say, do you love me? Jesus, you know that I love you because I go to church. Wrong answer. Oh, Jesus asked me, do I love you? And, and you say, yes, you, Lord, you know I love you because I tithe and I give my money. Wrong answer. Jesus, you know that I love you because I work in the church and I'm a good provider and I, and I do all these things. Wrong answer. The reality is, the only correct answer is, do I love you? I love you, Lord, with all my heart, my soul, my mind. The reality is, every one of us has a box of fears. Whatever is in your box of fear, it may be what's going on in your marriage and your family. It may be your future if you're a young adult in your high school going to college and, and, and that fear, what's the future going to have in store for me? And what, what am I going to do? Uh, maybe it's, you know, I'm looking for a husband or a wife and, and, and I'm fearful that, I, that I'll never have anyone. Uh, uh, maybe it's your, it's your unsaved loved ones that are in that box of fear. Uh, uh, maybe it's a sickness or going to the doctors and what if the doctors tell me? Uh, maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your future. Uh, uh, maybe it's stuff that is going on in your life. And the reality is many of those things that are in that box of fear is very self-centered and, and, and I'm not able to trust God because if I am full of fear I can't love and I can't trust but the moment I bring the box of fears to God and I says God I open this little box and I let you take care of it because I can't fix any one of them I can't control them 
I can't manipulate them. I can't change them. I need to say, Lord, I, I bring my box to you, and I need to learn to trust you. It says in Psalm 27, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but I trust in the name of the Lord. How many remember the movie Titanic? History says that when Titanic was built, it was said it was the ship that was unsinkable. But we know the story. The reality is, underneath the water, there was an iceberg, and it hit the bar, and it hit, the, and it caused the hole into the middle, and it caused that Titanic ship, the unsinkable ship, to go down. The reality is, life does that to us. There will be things that will hit our lives. It will break us. It will sink us. It will shake us. And the things in this world will fall apart. But I'm so glad I have someone who knows about tomorrow and will hold my hand. It says in Psalm 32, 10, many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man that trusts in him. If you want God's love, it comes as you trust in him. In Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4, when I am afraid, I will trust in you, in God whose word. I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Let me tell you, when I heard the news, I had to say, Lord, I'm afraid, but I'm going to trust in you, God. I'm going to put my hope in you. It says in Psalm 1, 118, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put your trust in man. I love Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, worship him, confess to him, love him, and he will direct your paths. In John chapter 14, I thank you. No matter where you're going, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My my father has, has many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going and we don't know how to get there. And Jesus answered, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father unless he comes through the Son. Whatever you're fearing today, the answer is love. Love the Lord Jesus with everything you have. One last thing. If you want to deal with fear, you've got to acknowledge him. You've got to confess him with your mouth. You've got to love him. But you've got to follow him. Follow him. See, too many people want to be the leader. They want Jesus to follow them. I hate the bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot. God is not my co-pilot. That's saying that I'm the pilot and God's just going to come along for the ride and if something happens, he'll take over. No, God's the pilot. He's the pilot. He may ask me from time to time to do some things, but he's the pilot. We get into trouble when we think we're the pilot. It says in Matthew 10, 38, and anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. See, Jesus is calling us to commitment. Oh, we love to acknowledge him. We'll worship him. Oh, we may even go around saying that we're a Christian. Oh, if we were to ask, we'd probably all say, oh, yes, I love Jesus. But how many of us are willing to follow him? I mean, really follow him. See, we live in a society that really doesn't know what commitment is all about. We throw our marriages away like it's no big deal. We throw situations away. We throw our jobs away. We leave churches. We leave relationships. We throw in the towel. When things get tough, and God is saying, you want to deal with fear, you pick up your cross, and you follow me. What if Jesus came to your house? If Jesus came to your house to spend a day or two, if he came unexpectedly, I wonder what you would do. 
Oh, I know you give your nicest room to such an honored guest. And all the food you serve him would be the very best. And you would keep assuring him you're glad to have him there. That serving Jesus in your home is a joy beyond compare. But when you saw him coming, would you meet him at the door with arms outstretched in welcome to your heavenly visitor? Or would you have to change your clothes before you let him in? Or hide some magazines and put the Bible where they'd been? Would you turn off the computer and hope that he had not seen? And wish you hadn't uttered that last loud hasty word. Would you hide your worldly music and put your Christian music out? Could you let Jesus walk right in or would you have to rush about? And I wonder if the Savior spent a day or two with you. Would you go right on doing the things you always do? Would you take Jesus everywhere you plan to go? Or would you have to change your plans for just a day or so? Would you be glad to have him stay until his visit ends, or would you be glad to have him stay forever on and on? Or would you sigh with great relief when he at last was gone? It might be interesting to know the things you would do if Jesus came in person and spent some time 